so the first project I'll really uh, show you in detail is the Norwegian National Opera that's just opened in Oslo, Norway. It's on the Oslo Fjord, uh, right up against the city, right near our office. So in fact, we were very happy because uh, we could look out the window and see the project. There's our office and there's the site. So we didn't have to fly for 10 hours to get there and that uh, was a little unusual for us. Uh, the site's really exceptional. It's uh, although quite um, um, sort of messy before the project started. In fact, it had been an industrial area for 150 years. Uh, the logging industry used it as a sawmill. They dumped all their uh, they dumped all their sawdust into the water, which created about 60,000 tons of pollution, uh, which was part of our project to deal with. I'll mention that later. Um, it was built on infill, this area, so um, it had been rather nasty for a long time when it was decided to build an opera there. The site itself is interesting in that uh, it has a partially on land and a partially in the water sort of condition. Uh, so here you can see the old river, uh, Akerselva, leading through Oslo, uh, a shoreline that was developed over time along the river, and as you see now how the site actually straddles those two uh, conditions. So, in fact, part of this opera was meant to be literally in the water. Our design, uh, and this was an international competition, it was anonymous, by the way, same as the Alexandria Library. So it was an interesting uh, process to try and develop uh, this without talking to the client, as anonymous competitions are. But our building uh, sort of faces the, the city rather than out to the fjord, like many of you imagine, for example, the Sydney Opera House, which sort of looks out into the sea. This one looks directly into the city in a very, very uh, definite way. It's re removed from uh, the land by a small bridge, which takes you onto a plaza. And uh, that plaza is accessible to everyone, whether you're going to the opera or not. And it's part of a, a development which is leading pedestrians along the waterfront in Oslo. I wanted to show this picture because this was the original competition entry that we made in, uh, was, uh, was it 1999? 2000, uh, and uh, we were just really using AutoCAD uh, in a very simple way. So these are simple fill uh, operation in AutoCAD. But I wanted to show this because I was very excited about how we approached this. Similar with the Alexandria Library, the plans were laid out like flags. And we always thought that it's important when you're doing a big competition, you have to have some way to get the juror to really see what you're doing. For whatever reason, we chose the check flag. <laughs> So the check flag was the inspiration for, for uh, laying out this plan in the competition, and it, it really gave a very clear identity to how the functions were laid out. Uh, the actual plan for the building as it, uh, it was eventually built is very similar to that original uh, uh, drawing, and it has several venues in it. It has a 1,400-seat theater, a 400-seat theater, and a 250-seat theater, uh, all served by lobbies and uh, warehouse, uh, sorry, uh, workshop areas and backstage areas. There's 650 people that work in this building and several thousand that visit it uh, often during the week. So it has to be very simple. It's an extremely straightforward sort of sedimentary plan and it has very easy m m methods to move uh, for those that work in the building from front of house to back of house and, and traversing the site in a north-south direction. There's a, something I'll show you in a moment. It's called the back of house highway. So everybody can feed into this and feed into the uh, theater rooms very easily. The building is extremely low to the ground. It's, it's pushed down as low as we could possibly make it. So that rather than being a monument in the sense of something that you look at, it's something that you look past. It's a link between the center of the city and the nor uh, eastern areas and northeastern areas where we're beginning to be developed as residential areas. So by creating this low profile, you were able to stand in the city, see across the building, and connect to other parts of the city. And that's an important decision that we made very early on. We knew that we, the, the brief for the project called for a monument, but we didn't just want to make a monument that you take pictures of. We instead called it a social monument, a monument that you could take participate in and with. Uh, and that, we felt, would provide more sense of ownership by the people uh, of the city and the people that visited it. The section I, I find really beautiful, it sort of um, um, ascends from the fjord uh, and lifts up off the ground, sort of cracks where the lobby is, flies out over the factory areas of the back of the house, and where the stage is, it just pops through in a very um, arbitrary manner. Uh, the the people that work in the building, as I mentioned, the 600, over 600 people live in a, in a space that's functional. It's not a sculptural idea. 
It's a kind of a machine, uh, very much threaded with uh, daylight, natural light, natural air. Uh, in contrast to that, the public face of the building is what everyone demands of an opera, uh, having a sculptural kind of identity. It's a part of the city of the imagination. Uh, in a way, many people don't go to the opera. They just like to know that it's there. They're happy if it's, if it's there. <laughs> so um, in a way, it has to address that, that sense of imagination. When you put the two together, the factory, the machine, and the sculptural blanket, uh, uh, which is stone, it's almost as if two different architects were working on the building. And as several people have said in our office, after seeing the building after it opened, at times it even looks like 30 different architects worked on the building. And I think that's a part of the process of how we work. But here you can see uh, this low profile, this stone uh, blanket uh, filtering down and actually going straight into the fjord, into the salt water, and rising up over the top of the opera so you can sort of stand on it. It, it reintroduced the natural landscape into the urban environment. It created a valley where there once was a very clear valley. It distinguishes itself from the vertical articulation of the surrounding buildings. And of course, it being a national opera, it had to, in many ways, resolve the identity of the nation of Norway. And this was done in many ways, but I think probably the most popular uh, understanding of the building is the notion of a landscape, of an open landscape, which is, is folded and, and, and at times uh, cold, dry, and hard in a similar way that the snow and the landscape feels. Uh, we began to develop that idea very early, and the first models show these planes as they lift and, and break uh, out of the, the uh, initial form. It's nice, this picture, because uh, it's sort of reflective. And actually, in the winter, when the fjord freezes, it doesn't freeze every year, but when it does freeze, especially nowadays, it's freezing less and less, actually, <laughs> interestingly. But uh, uh, the ice uh, that, that is pushed in the spring thaw uh, back and forth by the tides gets pushed up this ramp and makes a sort of ice sculpture uh, in, the, in, the, in the years when uh, it's colder. Uh, uh, to develop those forms, we try to create a linear pattern that would somehow lead the eye up the building. Uh, we eventually chose a, a marble to, um, to build this, uh, this, this, this form from uh, Italian marble for several reasons. First of all, Italy is, uh, of course, the home of Western opera, so there was a historical connection between the material and the art form. But also, interestingly, marble is one of the few stones that actually has acoustic properties. So you can make an, a xylophone out of, out of marble. And in fact, on opening night, uh, they made musical instruments out of leftover marble and played them. It was really quite beautiful sound that marble has. Um, as we, after we chose that uh, material, we realized that you had to break it up into different features, different steps and forms to create a sort of moving, smaller scale pattern across uh, this landscape, which is really quite large. Uh, we began to develop a monolithic uh, stone uh, material system. These are all, all of this stone, again, is, is uh, self-supporting in many ways. It's not thin, so in fact, what you're looking at is one piece of stone. This is one piece of stone. It's not a separate stone. So it was hand carved and hand uh, treated on site uh, to create each of these patterns. And as we began to develop that in more detail, uh, we had to find a scripting pattern that would allow the degree of randomness that we wanted uh, on this plane. And here you can see the uh, initial sketch uh, during schematic design, early design. And then construction started. And construction was very exciting in Oslo because people had been waiting for this opera for over 100 years. It started in 1885, I think, the discussion of doing uh, this opera. So uh, it was quite a, an important part of the history of the city. It was so exciting to many people that even before construction was finished, uh, they started making advertisements and using it in magazines and things. The pressure became so high that six months before the construction deadline, they actually had to close off the site for a day on a Sunday. They put an ad in the paper and said uh, that the site would be open to the public for one day. They only expected a few thousand people. They hired, I think, six security guards. And instead, uh, some uh, 13,000 people showed up. And they started climbing all over the building and in the building and going <laughs> all over the place. I, I was very fortunate to be there on that day and snapped a lot of pictures. But it really was an astounding uh, 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 feeling to be there, seeing people simply occupying this construction site uh, it's such a, such a rare occasion that you get to see that. Uh, I think certainly here in the U.S. that would probably never happen. Uh, the safety issues would, would, be, would sort of overwhelm everything. Um, but nevertheless, people enjoyed it. And uh, uh, there were all kinds of activities occurring on this roof uh, throughout the day. People doing different things. 
Uh, as you climb up the building and up the roof, uh, you, you, you turn around at, the, at this one uh, sort of platform. You can see the city uh, beyond, and then you turn again uh, towards the actual roof of the opera, and there's a really beautiful condition here where the water is reflected in the glass of the lobby, and it feels as though you're walking simply on a kind of huge uh, uh, unsupported platform toward the sky. And as you make that 180 degree turn, there's a bulge in the roof so that you're not able to see the handrails or the people in the distance. And you at first have the sensation that you're about ready to walk off the edge. And as you get closer, you begin to see more and more people collecting towards the edge of the building. And there's a tremendous sense of, of, uh, of forgetfulness because the city is gone, your, your life is behind you in many ways, your daily life, and you're simply suspended in the air uh, over the Oslo Fjord. And still though, uh, as you get closer, there is of course a handrail. It, it maybe looks like there isn't one, but there is one. And people just go immediately to the edge and then rediscover their city. So they, they've, they've in a way taken a, a transformative experience, uh, entering from the city, leaving the city, and returning to it, yet at a different level than they would normally on a sidewalk or on a street. Uh, they look down at the people below, uh, ramping as the stone ramps down into the, into the fjord, at the boats nearby, and really you get to see the city in a unique way. People do anything, they bring their dogs there. I, I think it's great, I always say it's a good sign if people are comfortable letting their dog shit on your building, then you've done really, really well. And, uh, <laughs> and in, in a sense, uh, there is a, a tremendous feeling of ownership. It's, it's not as though even the, this building doesn't belong to the architect, it belongs to the people that occupy the space. People um, with wheelchairs make it to the top. Uh, there are different ways to get there if you're in a wheelchair. Um, there are also people with their baby carriages sort of moving around. This was in August, so the weather was really very nice. Sort of human drama just playing out in every corner that you looked. Um, and uh, uh, different age groups I also thought was quite intriguing. Again, when you descend down the uh, other side of the, the building, uh, you get the same effect where the water uh, sort of passes under this, this vast ramp and leads you back down uh, to the ground level again. You can see it's a construction site because they, they really, they, didn't, they just left everything where it was. All kinds of people. I, I'm not quite sure how far this person walked to get to the opera, but <laughs> it looked like he came from a long way. <laughs> An elderly couple, which I actually followed all the way up to the top of the building and down. They made it all the way up there. They sat on some un, unfinished marble at the bottom. More dogs. I like this where people get to the lobby area and they look down to see what's going on in, in the lobby. And you'll see another picture in a moment from the lobby looking up at all the people looking back. And young people came, people who would never ordinarily probably visit an opera. And uh, they, were, they may someday wish to, to buy a ticket, but for the time being they just enjoyed the fact that they could be on the roof of the opera and, uh, and sort of um, be a part of the, the, the life of the city. Uh, families would take their children down because the, the, the ramp actually goes to the, to into the water. And you know, this is really the standard condition. You can't touch the water anywhere. But here you can actually come and get your feet wet. And it does get warm enough to, to swim in Norway, so in the summer. Um, opening night was, of course, a big deal, and we were very nervous, and we wondered, will it be as exciting after opening night? Uh, and just a few more pictures. This is after the opening. So then 30, some, tw what was it, 28,000 people came in the first day. The line went just straight down into the city. Uh, people were, again, just sort of occupying this roof like I'd never seen. They crossed the bridge. This is the entry area, and uh, looking toward the entrance, you get this rather bizarre feeling that all these people are are somehow leaving the, 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 the gravity uh, that surrounds you as you enter uh, on the lower level. Um, looking up to the people on top, looking down. Again, and what I thought was great about this is that even in bad weather, people are going up there. So it's raining and people don't care. And, and uh, in that sense, uh, there's a, a, a lot of activity sort of during all the seasons uh, going down to the sea. And so occasionally it gets uh, quiet. So these are some pictures I took I'm uh, sorry, I didn't take these. Uh, a, fr uh, a photographer from our, that works with our office a lot took these on an early morning when it was quiet. Uh, 
The fly tower, the stage tower, is clad in aluminum, and the aluminum is sort of punctured with uh, a, 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 pa a pattern. It's convex and concave sort of shapes in and out of the aluminum. Uh, that is actually taken from something which you wouldn't expect. If you know anything about weaving, uh, a long time ago uh, when they first created looms, uh, there was this kind of pattern which you could create using punch cards, or weaving punch cards. And so the pattern that you see is in fact a pattern that was developed uh, after one of these uh, cards that uh, created a loom system in the industrialized weaving era. And that's from an, uh, a traditional, traditional uh, Norwegian sweater that could be woven out of those patterns. Nobody knows that, of course. Only you know that. Nobody else knows that. <laughs> um, and here's a detail of that pattern. And of course, when the sun hits it, it creates this very interesting, almost mace masonry uh, pattern uh, on the aluminum. And people uh, also seem to gravitate towards that and like to have their pictures taken there. At night, the uh, main lobby, which rises up from the, from the marble surface, uh, becomes a kind of a beacon. And since really most people that will visit this building, uh, if you're visiting as an opera goer, you will probably come in the evening and probably not come in the summer because often the summer is the quiet time for ballet and opera. So many of the shows are in the fall, winter, and early spring. So this is the way you would really experience the building uh, as a sort of almost a mirage across the, the water. And as you approach, um, you come closer to the entry, which is very discreet, laid into this one facade, and you enter into the lobby. Uh, the lobby is rather extensive. It's uh, about 100 meters, uh, so 300 feet uh, from end to end, and it moves in different ways through the uh, different areas of the theaters. There's some toilets and coat rooms and so forth, and a cafe that looks out over the fjord. So uh, here you can see the composition of that lobby, and this curved wall, which is the barrier between the theater and the public space, is in fact running right where the, uh, the initial um, landscape was, um, uh, in other words, the, the land runs here, and so all of this is on water and all of that's on, on land. Um, we really wanted to create a space that, that didn't have any domestic feel at all, that was almost an, uh, a, a sort of odd feeling that you were in some form of, of scaleless landscape. So in fact, we removed all the lights from the ceiling. You'll see that in a moment this, this rendering is fairly accurate and that there's really nothing up there. These columns, which you might think we were just kind of having fun, actually are tilted for a reason. Since this part of the building is over water, it has a pile foundation system, which has a different grid than the roof structure. We spent several weeks trying to get them aligned, and it was just so much so difficult. We finally said, well, why bother? Why do they have to be aligned? Let's leave the piles where they are and leave the beams where they are and just make the shortest line between them. So all of these columns are coming down to a pile location. And they're bowed in the middle because obviously that's where the greatest moment is. So they have to be the stiffest in that location. And so you begin to see here the effect of, of that space. And the, these people are outside looking in. And they're, of course, inside looking out. The actual uh, uh, feeling is one of having multiple levels uh, of inside out, up and down, uh, natural and unnatural. The uh, idea here is that the glass is really just all glass. It's very primitive. We tried to limit the amount of steel. Where there's wood, it's all wood. Where there's stone, it's all stone. Very, very simple palette of materials. And uh, nevertheless, the effect is, is quite uh, um, sort of uh, subtle in that you, you never really sense the, 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 the vastness of the, the primitive use of materials. This is the acoustic wall. This picture is taken from the outside looking in. Uh, towards the, uh, the um, seating areas. We designed the furniture. These are some of the images of the, the furniture that's scattered throughout the lobby. Uh, and also, uh, you can see, I think, some of the sofas here. Uh, we've created a few um, cafes and bars that people use. The toilets are kind of exciting. Everyone always forgets toilets, but we wanted to make a big deal out of them. So, in fact, we had an international competition to do the toilets, and Olafur Eliasson won. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was kind of interesting because this sort of big name uh, artist doing the toilets. And, uh, and it ended up being a, a very uh, a nice, nice approach that he had. He created this kind of web pattern that uh, it spans around the, the actual toilets themselves. And they have this uh, unusual soft light that changes uh, during a performance. Children really love this thing. I, I think they, they think of it as a, uh, like an Easter egg or something. The colors are, are quite soft. 
and you'll often see people being uh, approaching them. As you pass through these layers of color and light, the exterior being very bright, this white marble, uh, this open space of the lobby, these white soft forms of the toilets, and as you move into the toilets, it becomes exactly the opposite. It's extremely dark, so the toilets are uh, very, very almost cave-like. A very, uh, 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 you really get a primitive feeling of, of, of taking a pee when you're in these rooms. It's <laughs> really kind of fun, and 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 the men's and women's are exactly the same. It's not like a pink toilet and a blue toilet. They're, they're both equally dark and and, and heavy. Uh, that's the men's on the left and the women's on the right. Uh, a funny thing happened when we were making the uh, lobby space. Because the roof slopes down, and this is the main lobby area here, there was a spot where if you continued the floor, you'd eventually bump your head. So we tried different schemes with a, like a handrail or something like that. Um, they all seemed silly. So instead, we sort of raised up this platform and thought that'll be enough to keep people from hitting their head. It'd be a sort of natural thing to do. But people discovered it. It's polished marble, so now everyone climbs up this thing and slides down it. So when you go there on a, on a Saturday or Sunday, you'll see all these kids going there and sliding up and down, and even some architects. Those are two people in our office, actually. <laughs> uh, the main transition wall that, um, that divides the public world from the world of the magic of the theater is entirely made of oak. Uh, it's this rather beautiful wall that's treating uh, the lobby in an acoustic manner. It's sort of golden colored and when the sunlight filters through in the evenings it turns it in almost on fire. It's as though the wood has caught fire. Um, but it's a quite beautiful pattern. We had a lot of difficulty with this because for acoustic purposes it needed to be a totally random pattern. It took us a while to get that. The builder wouldn't do it. Um, they said, look, you're the architect, you're better at random than we are. <laughs> we couldn't get it random enough. Eventually uh, it was discovered that there was a school for uh, um, mentally challenged uh, children, and we gave them all the wood. They made the panels at the school and delivered it. It was delivered to the site, and the builder put it up. So, uh, children have a better time at being random, if you know what I mean. <laughs> There's some details of that. It's a, a beautiful surface which uh, helps to control the acoustics in the room. As you move through that curtain of oak, you enter into a world purely of wood. There's, again, no other materials. It's a soft, moving forms uh, that lead you to, your, to, to the theaters. And uh, they change form in different ways uh, as you're um, not only descending vertically, but also horizontally. And occasionally, they'll open up and allow a view out to the fjord or out to the exterior. Um, if you're taking the elevator, it's also a kind of bizarre experience. I, it feels like you're in 2001 A Space Odyssey or something. Where, which opera seat are you going to, Al? The room itself is uh, quite simple. It's a horseshoe shape, which is traditional for, for uh, opera building. We didn't want to reinvent or invent a new type of, of room. This kind of room has been developed over 600 years, so there's really not a lot of need to change it too much. But we did want to provide it with an identity that we felt was appropriate. We looked at the development of instruments and how instruments are made and the notion of creating the opera chamber as a resonance chamber. And as a result, we began to understand methods of building with materials that could be seen, once again, as entirely monolithic. So the room, the main hall of the opera, is in fact entirely made out of laminated monolithic oak, which is carved into its shape and then um, uh, uh, mounted onto the steel framework that holds the balconies. Um, but really, when you enter the room, you see nothing uh, but oak uh, other than the canvas of the chairs and the metal of the stage lights. So again, you've m entered into a dark, dark, dark space, and this is even lighter than what it feels in real life. Um, someone, it's been said it, it feels like being inside of a, a nut, kind of in a dark, dark room. Uh, it's uh, really quite beautiful in that the uh, shapes that you see on the balcony rails were entirely designed with the acoustic engineer who sort of sketched them out, and we just made them. We, we really uh, almost took them literally from their sketches. Uh, here you can see with the lights up a little higher uh, the relationship between the balconies and uh, the balcony rails and the seating. Uh, here's a, a view of the room looking toward the proscenium opening and um, there's this rather unusual chandelier at the top which is made of LED and crystal. It's also an acoustic reflector so it does it not only adds light but reflects uh, a sound in the room appropriately. Here's a kind of detail of it. It really sort of hovers uh, here's a, a picture, a very close picture of one of those strips that you just saw. 
Uh, depending on where you sit in, in the room, on the higher balconies, you get a really unusual view of the chandelier when it lights up, almost a, um, a, a, a feel, feels longitudinal, uh, this form. It actually does have a curve, a bow to it. Um, the other amazing part of the room, which I'm really fascinated by, is the stage curtain. Uh, it's made by an artist, Pei White, who's actually an American artist, part of a competition. Here's a detailed view of it. Uh, this, uh, and I know you probably won't believe it, but there's absolutely no three-dimensional character to this whatsoever. It's no more than a couple of millimeters thick. Uh, it's uh, woven cotton in a kind of tapestry. Uh, so to give you an idea of scale, uh, this is a child standing in front of it. The artist uh, worked with aluminum on her uh, sort of um, tabletop, scanned the various forms, and then created this tapestry based on, on those studies. Another thing that's astonishing about this curtain is that although it looks silver, there's not a single silver thread in the entire thing. It's all made by a mix of, uh, of color in, in there. So if you look very closely, you can see the individual threads. Uh, I know that it's hard to believe, because I even when I'm standing there, I can't believe it, but if you run your hand across that, you won't feel any bumps. Uh, the lights are all tucked in uh, in different ways. Uh, there's uh, another theater which you enter. It's a 400-seat theater from the main hall, and that leads you up a kind of stair or directly into a more contemporary space. And this is the 400-seat theater uh, that's used for dance and contemporary arts. So it has a very uh, a fresh feel as opposed to the classical, traditional feel of the main opera. There's also a 250-seat experimental theater that can be used at times, and we design these acoustic baffles uh, that are actually all over the building. We use the same baffle everywhere to reduce cost. This is the main corridor, which we call the back of house highway. Everything leads into this, so you never get lost. And, and believe me, if you've ever been backstage in an opera, it's really easy to get lost. They're very complicated places. But everyone knows they can come here and get sort of everywhere they need to go. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, that form in the rear uh, is really a functional, functionally designed and, and, and attributed primarily by its uh, need for light and air and space. Uh, some of the spaces have very large objects in them. This is where they, they paint the, the stage sets in the, in the workshop uh, near the big uh, rear stage areas. It's meant to be very comfortable, perhaps too comfortable, as this man has found out. Uh, this is a view of that room uh, once construction was complete. Originally, these windows weren't here. They were added later uh, because the people that worked there said they liked to see out people walking by, and that's a new thing in theater design. It used to be you wanted to keep everything hidden so not to dis expose the magic of the theater, but people are a little different now. So all of the uh, costume uh, shops are visible from the exterior. The ballet studios are raised in the building with views of the surrounding city so that you are able to um, uh, have a, a, a feeling of, of openness and height in the actual studios themselves. Uh, the uh, orchestra rehearsal room also has light, natural light leading out to the main street nearby. And one of the interesting parts of the back of house area is that there's a garden, a big garden, which is only accessible by the people that work in the building. No visitor knows that it exists. You can't see it from anywhere in the outside. It's screened off in all directions. So that if you work there, if you're a performer, you can always go here and sort of escape from, from everyone. I'm sort of interested to see it in operation. I've only seen it uh, off, uh, out of showtime. But all of these are dressing rooms, and they go around four sides. So. I think during a th show, you'll have four walls of people half naked running around, which would be kind of exciting. <laughs> the, uh, the cafe uh, sits with a, a balcony uh, straight out to the fjord, again with natural light and air. Uh, the dressing rooms, as I said, face on to, the, to this garden. We call it the actor's garden. And um, in a building this big where you have, I think we had 1,350 different door types it's actually cheaper to make your own doorknob than it is to buy one off the shelf. So we, d we also design the door handles. 